Hello and welcome back to the Villa Filler podcast. I'm here as always with my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, Aston Villa nil, Spurs 4. I'm going to take you back a week, a week, nine days. Um, I was, it was the day, it was the day before Luton away uh, and I get a text from somebody at Five Live and they were like, do you want, do you want to come on the show tomorrow? Um that's actually all they said. Do you want to come on the show tomorrow? I didn't know what I was going to talk about. I didn't know if it's the bloody cricket, the rugby. I assumed it was about Villa. And I, obviously I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll happily oblige. You know, I've done it a few times. Uh was on the show with Mark Chapman. They woke up. Ashley Williams and Rob Green. So quite quite the uh, ensemble. Yeah. And I had about five minutes and they sort of asked me about Villa. And, you know, uh, to if anybody heard, let me know in the comments. Um they were like, you know, how are you feeling in top four? And I maybe foolishly said that it was nailed on. If it, and it was caveated with the if, and you can go and listen to it in the BBC Sounds app. It was whatever day we played Luton. It was about um, 11.30, something like that. I said, if we beat Spurs, top four is 100% ours. Is that coming back to bite me on the arse, mate? Because we, you know, only hours later... Needed a 90th, uh, 89th minute winner to get past Luton. We've then gone to Ajax by a Luton again, actually, for me the other day. Luton twice in a week is a bit depressing. Struggled to get past Ajax, you know, 0-0. Still all to play for, so definitely not the worst result in the world. Yeah. And we're now talking on the back of an absolute ass-pounding home defeat to Tottenham. I think we can pin the season's failure on myself, really, can't we, at this point? Oh, well, that's what it looks like, mate. That's what it, it looks really like. does. Mate, you know what? I, I, I want to start off with a little apology because, obviously, whilst you were travelling back from Amsterdam, um, I hopped on under here and I was like, yeah, Dan and I will be back here to preview the Spurs game and everything like that. Um, it didn't quite end up happening. Obviously, you were travelling back and everything like that. And then we got back and we were kind of going to sit down like the night before or the morning of the game. And we were like, no, nah, we'll, just, we'll just come to it after. Um, so sorry to everybody that you didn't get an additional podcast, but for me personally, I'm being totally selfish here and saying that I'm really glad that we didn't yeah. because I was so optimistic going into this game. I was so optimistic. I bet the only other Villa fan in my office here in Manchester, a tenor that we would win the game. I was so, I was texting my mates. I was like, yeah, guys, book it. It's going to be one of those all time Villa Park. I do remember the um, last season, it was kind of a similar feeling game that Newcastle at home, I think yeah. it was a 12.30, yeah. and we just came out and it was like a rout. I remember JJ scored, Oli scored. That's the kind of vibe I had. I was like, man, it's Villa Park. I really like this Spurs team. I like what they do, but we're just going to like, we're going to be there. We're going to be ready. We're going to do that goal in the first 10 minutes thing that we love to do in big games. Um, and I'm 10 pound down. Um, significantly more than that if I look at what I lost, it's lost in bet 365 predicting the same outcome there's no plug there by the way but yes I was so hopeful going into this game I quite literally had put my money where my mouth is and that preview would have aged like milk so yeah from my ego I'm quite glad that it didn't happen I mean it's just what what do you say, right? Because the dust has settled obviously we're talking now it's it's sort of Monday evening for those of you who may be listening uh, later on, um, I feel I still feel pretty numb to it, you know, and I think there is there are sorry logical reasons why we lost this game. And if I'm being completely honest, and I hate to just sort of boil it down to just you know one stupid thing that people don't think matter. You know, I the one thing that I've I, I think I've I've sort of I've I've zo- I've sort of zoomed out a little bit a lot this season right when it comes to you now I, I I was I'd always be one of the first people to go the players aren't trying they aren't doing this they aren't doing that that's just redundant right that is redundant I can I can tell you for a fact th- this season especially has totally changed my perspective on that um but I just can't like it's it's literally for me as simple as what Ange Postacoglu said in the post-match press conference we look tired they were absolutely shagged there's no way in hell we were ready physically for this game. And 
people sort of neglect to acknowledge the fact that Spurs obviously didn't have to play on Sunday, so there would have been pressure. And yes, they've had their fair share of injury problems, but they had a much better week to effectively prepare for this game. And, you know, the boys looked tired in, in Amsterdam on Thursday as well. They really did. I think that's ultimately what both of these results, you know, the draw and the loss, boil down to. I think it's tiredness. I don't think it's a lack of effort. And, I, I mean, to to go back to the effort point, I can see there, there's like individual cases where I'm like, yeah, I can get on board with that. Like Zaniolo, but I look at him and I don't think he ever has, you know, even when he was at Roma... He wasn't the most, you know, he never covered the most the the most grass on the pitch and he was never this, you know, all action, pressing, uh, aggressive midfielder come forward, come winger, whatever, you know, wherever he chose to be deployed. But I, I don't think it's for a lack of effort. I just think the boys are fucking tired. And I know that makes us for a really boring podcast for everybody listening, but I think it's that simple. I think, you know, with a, uh, yeah, but he, both teams, clean of health all players available all players fit a whole week to prepare for this I think Villa win and we proved that in the away leg we still had injuries in the away leg and we were able to get the job done against Spurs but I mean you sort of have to take your hat off to Ange don't you there was some sort of brilliant in-game management there and clearly whatever he told them at halftime worked because they came out of the traps flying and killed us with those two early goals yeah it was a really bizarre game um i don't think it's any coincidence that we looked particularly tired because it was um the most intense definitely the first 45 that like of any 45 i think i've seen at Villa park this season even those city and arsenal games um and when i say intense i don't necessarily mean like the intensity of the football but the physicality of it like the first half was a fight like it was so intense there were challenges flying in everywhere it, the game sort of felt like it came and went in waves um it was so physical there were so few shots in the first half but it still felt so entertaining because it was so all action it was very physical the midfield battle was particularly tough challenges were kind of flying in you had the whole you know Matty Cash felt like definitely from the away end but also by some kind of Blurs players that he was potentially being targeted. It was there were so many different elements to the game, and it was. I honestly, one of the things I took note of in the first half that I wanted to. This was kind of pre-defeat, but just it was a genuine. And I'm going to say this now because it, like it wasn't all doom and gloom. It was a genuine positive experience for me to see Villa compete like that because we met this side head on who came to us. And was so aggressive and was so well set up and was so up to the game. And in the first 45, I genuinely felt like we met that challenge with full force. And I've seen so many Villa like teams, even in the kind of not so distant future, just wilt under that. And I think it's a genuine like testament to how far we've come that we stood up to that in the first half. And I don't know whether it was just because the effects of that first half started to set up. But as you say, mate, it just never... Spurs came out exactly the same in the second half. And we just never really did. And it's a shame. It's a shame because whilst I'm not going to sit here and say that we could have won the game or anything like that, Spurs were much the deserved team. And obviously we'll come on to the red card. But after about 60, 70 minutes kind of really felt like the writing was on the wall and that's the game was kind of going on because of the nature of that first half because of how few and far between chances were the first goal again I I don't want to just kind of shout people in cliches but whoever got the first goal you felt it would be so impactful because it never really felt even if Spurs had just stayed at one like we were ever going to go and get two goals in that game just because of the nature of how difficult it was to get out there and play our football and so I think collectively, once they got one and then obviously they get the second so soon after, it it just felt that the game was beyond our reach from that moment and then tensions boil over, everybody gets a little frustrated and then past the 90th minute, there's just an all-out collapse. But yeah, it's it's a very 
difficult one to stomach and Villa do have this kind of tendency now to not just lose games but to kind of all out implode it's not often that we lose games but when we do we tend to do so pretty spectacularly and whilst look if we're going to lose games at the rate that we are it's not a massive cause for concern but yeah it is something that's kind of becoming more and more evident is that we, if we are going to go down, we're going to go down in flames. And perhaps the most alarming thing about yesterday is not the defeat, but the resulting eight-goal swing in goal difference. That's the that's the big concern, isn't it? You know, at two 0 when when Guinea is is shown red, you just think I take a two 0 here. I really would take a two 0 and they weren't able to hold on. It is what it is. But that's ultimately the biggest blow. They've got a game in hand. It is However, against Chelsea, which will not be as as easy as people think, but you know, games like that, there are so many narratives, there are so many storylines that are all sort of working with and against each other at any given point. James Madison, the ultimate pantomime villain, probably one of the greatest, as much as it pains me to say, he always puts on a show at Villa Park, doesn't he? And he's one of them players that, like you abuse him, and you just know. He's gonna score, like you just know, like like it's almost it's almost pointless, you know, having a dig at his hairline or whatever. Because well, do you know what it felt like, mate? I'm sorry to like butt in, I'll hand it back to you. But do you remember when Jamie Vardy used to come to Villa Park? Yeah, we always used to chant about his wife, and I would collectively stand and look at the people around me, like, "What are you doing?" As soon as we started chanting in the first half, it was on the wall. It was. You're right. You're absolutely right, mate. Every time, every, I don't think. I could never, I could never join in with them chants for many reasons, but one of them being, I just, I'd always know that Vardy would score against us and and give the whole and you know absolute hell and you know fair play to him for doing that. Same with Madders. Um, it's annoying, but that's football, isn't it? That's football. But um, I just like, I I think what was interesting about this game as well was. You know, the first half, I think Spurs created a few chances. They didn't actually look too dangerous. I thought we defended our box quite well. It was certainly a battle. We picked their pocket quite a few times, though, didn't we? There was a few sort of um, careless passes from the centre halves, and and you know, Oli really was getting the better of uh, Christian Romero with that ball being played over the top every time. You knew he was going to beat him to it, but unfortunately, at the same time, you knew that nothing was really going to come of it after he'd had a touch or two which was slightly frustrating. And I mean, there's even that chance, isn't there? Why is he, why is he trying to pass thread it to Leon instead of shooting after he's cut inside? I I don't really have any words for that. The game, as you say, it, it, it would have been defi- like, defined on such fine margins when both teams were sort of going at it like they were. Um, and who knows what could have happened there. But John McGinn, mate, I've seen it God knows how many times. And I think... Well, definitely amongst Villa fans. I don't think any Villa fan will agree with me. I think it's a red card. I think it's a red card. I think it's... I don't want to say careless, but you kind of know that... McGinn, well, first of all, I think McGinn was one of the, the few in midfield that was truly giving his best and more. Like, that, I don't think there was a single player that worked anywhere near as hard as John McGinn. I think John McGinn was probably running at one and a half times what everyone else was running at. He was he was absolutely brilliant. And literally ten seconds before he's gone in and 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 made a big tackle on one of the Spurs midfielders. I can't remember who it was. Um and every you know, Villa Park erupts. It's like, yes, come on, let's go. And then ten seconds later he's gone and done that because we've <laughs> we've encouraged him to. And it's just a bit like it you know, it's one of them if it's not you know I, I, what I will say is if it if that had have happened uh, in the corner of the pitch or anywhere else that isn't in directly in front of the it's like the post for bench, I think he maybe gets a yellow card. But I yes. think there's there's it's it happens in front of everybody. It happens right in front of the fourth official. There's a little bit of fisty cuffs after as well. You know people getting involved. The referee was just waiting to give a red card, and the only thing you can say is just like it's shit that you, you we've put ourselves in a situation where we're giving the referee the opportunity to give a red card. That's my two cents. Yeah, it, I wasn't see the first time, and I honestly didn't think it was a red. Um, I think you're absolutely right in saying that 
I think the reaction from the bench and the fact that John kind of seemingly wants a little bit more and like even Unai gets involved. I'm like, I don't think we've ever yeah. really seen that. Like Unai's right in the thick of it. And it's like, I think if you separated that incident, um, it's one of those where I think if you, right down to the letter of the law, maybe I'm not sure it's a red, but you can't look at it and be disappointed that it is. I mean, he flies in there. There's no intention to get the ball whatsoever. If you've played football at any level, you we've all been there. We have all been there. You just see the red mist and, you know, you're just going for a challenge. He's trying to stop a counter attack. Um, and look, the, the Spurs bench is rightly incensed, as we would be if a Spurs player had did that to a Villa player in the kind of similar thing, given that kind of the very physical nature of the game, the importance of the game, given everything that happened last time out with uh, passion, I think it was Benson Kirk. Um, I I, th- I totally understand why they were enraged, and it's because it's it's this kind of perfect storm. Uh, that I think the referee kind of gets caught up in that a little bit and dishes out the red. I think we're, we're never going to go and appeal it because of the nature of the challenge. Um, but Guinea should should know better. He should know better than to go and do that. I I I'm very sympathetic towards him because you're right I, I don't think the effort that he put into the game was being mimicked elsewhere uh, and maybe that's sometimes that's for the better Everyone, I often hear people say oh like what we do to have 11 John McGinn's on the pit um, that would either be amazing or complete chaos I think mean, sometimes some more level headedness is needed the reason why John McGinn is so good is because he is so unique but yeah it's one of those where I I I, I believe the challenge is an orange card. It is one of the perfect things where I think it, it falls between the two. Maybe it is more red than yellow, but yeah, you definitely can't complain at it. And it, yeah, it's it's again, it's the repercussions of this game beyond the the obvious in that it's not the three points that hurts. It's the eight goal swinging goal difference. And it's three games without the skipper in a time when you're also without Booba. Yeah. we're also you know it's back to back red cards this had never really happened obviously Ponza got sent off in Amsterdam um, that one was was unfortunate I'm not going to put it in the same bracket as John's but yeah to get back to back red cards it's two players that we're subsequently without for upcoming fixtures albeit in two different competitions it's just not what you need no it's not you know in, in that running in the league that's West Ham away it's Wolves at home and then it's Man City away incredibly tough incredibly tough fixtures and yeah. it's you know there's there's sort of been a debate the discussion is this uh tim's time to shine do you play yuri a bit further back what do you do i, well, I think the first thing you do is you don't play that bloody five at the back that we did against tottenham that can get in the bin um but i don't know i don't know i think um obviously you guys won't have known what I thought about Tim because we didn't get to chat about it, but I thought he was really good at Ajax for what it's worth. I thought he was really solid considering it was his second ever start for Aston mm-hmm. Villa, which seems mental because he's, it feels like he's, although he is extremely young, he's sort of been in and around the the sort of peripherals for quite a while. I know he's had his injury struggles, but I think ultimately you're asking a lot of, of Tim to go to the London Stadium well you know West Ham aren't flying by any means but they're certainly a dangerous side I mean Danny Ings could have had a hat trick the other day he had two goals disallowed didn't he right at the death um, you're putting you're, you, you know I, I, and you know, pressure makes diamonds but I think you know that, that run in a fixture specifically it just I don't know if it makes sense. I think Tillemans, you know, as we've kind of spoke about before, he doesn't operate best deeper. But I think if JJ's fit, you'd like to think that he can take Tillemans' spot and you know, you can sort of shuffle things around a little bit and make things a little bit more functional. Um, I think a sword you would rather fall on is Tillemans not being up to scratch in sort of out of position than throwing in Tim and doing god knows what psychological damage to the poor lad when we bottled the top four race yeah i mean tim i, I made the exact point in in my post game mate about tim in that I, I think whilst it wasn't a shining performance from him it's about it's his second ever start and it's away at ajax 
<laughs> mental. It's a, it's it's about as good as you can expect from a kid in that situation. Um, and I, I do agree that I don't think the London Stadium is the place for him, but I didn't think the Johan Cruyff Arena was the best place for him either, and, and he got the start there. And so he may well, he may well, I, I'm inclined to say, I think the best way to do it is perhaps look at going back to a kind of traditional 4-4-2, um, a two-man midfield. It really sucks that we're without JJ, because I think in terms of that all-action nature and someone that, plays at that kind of intensity maybe he's the only other certainly midfielder in the squad that can kind of get close to what John can do and I'm not sort of talking about the, the kind of similar role but in terms of the running power the grass that he can cover the way that he can carry the ball JJ is someone that I think we'd look to in this situation and it's it sucks that we can't really um I think who comes in will be really interesting because I thought Diaby was disappointing when he came on I'm really hoping that I, you know, I think we've got the Leon Bailey mould to kind of give us hope that, you know, what Bailey has kind of become this season is that hopefully the trajectory that Diaby is on. But yeah, he just, he really just looks shut for confidence right now, which is a shame because Lord knows we could really do with him firing. And when you look at the bench that we put out um, against Spurs, as you say, there's not a huge amount of midfield options in there. And so Unai's definitely got his work out, particularly given the, the gravity of the game midweek. And so it's going to be a tough old week. It's going to be a tough old week. Obviously, we've been buoyed by the fact that Wendy is back on the grass and he's running. I mean, obviously, he's in no way, shape or form in contention, but it's always perhaps a, a little bit of optimism that we needed. But yeah, Unai has definitely got his work out for him. And I think the only thing that is perhaps pointed us to the five at the back in the first place is that we've just got far more defenders at our disposal right now than we do midfielders and so from a strictly like strictly numerical point of view it, whether you stick with the formation like have we got the midfielders to go back to the kind of normal system I don't know uh it's going to be a very tough week at Bodymore it is mate it is it's such a huge game coming up at Ajax there still is plenty to play for and I am inclined to back us at home I I can't not I could not see Villa getting past Ajax even though I think it will be incredibly difficult and Ajax drew 2-2 I believe this weekend uh, Jordan Henderson getting his first Ajax assist and I think we've kind of got the playbook now right we sort of well of, of how they could play I think they will have to just come out all guns blazing as will we and I think they'll be a lot less conservative than they were um I, I you know for what it's worth I think the way they deployed their midfield was fantastic you know they really did box us in and Jordan Henderson as annoying as he is and, and was did a number on Douglas Louise a little bit I think um almost deployed him as as a 10 just follow just follow Douglas around and nullify Villa and that's what he did and it was really effective I felt so it's going to be interesting his return to in, to to England specifically, right? And how the crowds you would imagine would get on his back after his sort of Saudi move and all that. Um, there were some big misses for Ajax though in that game, weren't there? They were without Steven Bergwijn and Steven Bergwies, um, both wingers as well, which I think you know fundamentally is probably why Ajax looked to pack the midfield a little bit against us. Be interested to see if they're back and if so, what impact that will have against us mate how are you feeling going into this one I mean I think rightfully so a lot of a lot more people are feeling a lot less optimistic than they perhaps would have done had we have got the win on the weekend yeah that, it's, it's interesting actually um the I said I do worry for this one a little bit mate I won't lie. I do worry for this one. I have always kind of felt in my head that we would beat Spurs and then struggle in this game against Ajax. And I, I don't really know why that is, but um, I just, I kind of maintain that there's, there's not much that we can cling on to in the Europa League, barring that away performance against Alvaro, which I always reference, that we can really cling on to and say, yes, that's what we're capable of, of in this competition. It always kind of feels like we're just waiting for Villa to lift off mm. in the Europa Conference League, that we're waiting for that catalyst moment where 
we really go and strut our stuff and play our best football. And I was really hoping that it would be that away leg at Ajax, the stage, the opposition. You know, I made a big deal in the preview that this is, in theory, the perfect tie for Villa because you can have, you know, you can raise your game to the to the stage, the level that you're playing at. But it's also one of the weaker Ajax sides that we've seen kind of in recent years. And so you've got that perfect storm of it still will give you all of the same momentum boost as it would if you'd beaten one of the top Ajax sides. You're still going there to that city, to that stadium, playing in that environment, which just looks incredible. And Villa could really kick on from that moment. And it never really felt like we ever got going. And the problem is with playing knockout football is that if we're waiting for that moment, for that incredible game, that atmosphere, whatever it might be, where Villa just turn on the burners, as we've seen so many times in the league, if we're just waiting for that moment, then it's probably not going to come. Yeah. Because you just if, you, if we have another poor 90 minutes, we're, we're out of the competition. And so that's the only thing that worries me. And it, it quite literally is last chance to loan for Villa in that regard. Like it's it's play or go home. We we have to turn up in this game. This game has to be that moment that Spurs has done to really take this competition by the scruff of the neck and announce ourselves as favourites. Like every bookmaker across the continent will have Aston Villa nailed on to win this trophy. But from watching our games, we, we've not really shown that. Okay, yes, this is one of the more sterner tests that we could face on the run through to the final. But, you know, if if you look at, you know, Betis got knocked out by, I think it was Zagreb. Like any of these teams can turn up and do a number on you. As, we, you know, we saw with, with Legia Warsaw, like you're, you're not immune in this competition. And so we have to do it in this game. We really do. And of course we can. Of course we have the ability to, but... I feel like I've said it into every conference league game so far, whether it be, you know, Zerinsky Mostar, the chance to go and put five or six past this team and really put them to bed, announce ourselves. We didn't do it. Legia, we didn't quite get the revenge that we really wanted. Okay, Algmar away was that game, but even then we didn't really kick on from it. So I it's just so hard to to what to make of these games in the conference league, really. Yeah. No, you're right, mate. You're right. And I think the worry is, I think, from a fan's perspective as well, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people will be feeling this way, is that the team selection on Thursday was probably surprising in a few ways, you know, with, with Rogers and with Eric Bunham playing. It it felt like uh, we could have gone stronger. DRB playing as well, we could have gone stronger, but the sort of impetus was on the game on Sunday, right? And it, it, Unai has said before, qualifying for the Champions League is the goal if he can win a trophy along the way then I think he would be absolutely more than happy and he would take that if he could top four is the goal and we're now in a position where we haven't sewn this tie up yet and I do think that that was part of a nice plan for what it's worth I do think that that exactly how that game went is exactly how he had intended and had anticipated giving us the character dangle at Villa Park to go and really spur us on and hopefully give us that moment that you talked about. But the fact that we've gone and lost this game to Tottenham, if Villa lose now and go crashing out, and I I, I used the word crashing out as well because I was, I was chatting to some mates about it who weren't Villa fans and they were like, well, could Villa just get knocked out? Why, why is it crashing out? And I'm like, no, it would be crashing out. We're favourites to win this competition. If you go out, you have crashed out. That is the choice of verbiage. Then all of a sudden, I don't necessarily think people turn on Uno, and I definitely wouldn't would not condone that at all. But I think a few questions would certain certainly be asked, and a few eyebrows raised as to whether we're ready, whether we're good enough, whether you know the the squad's fit for purpose, or you know the usual things that happen when Villa lose and Villa fans have a meltdown, right? But it feels like this one could be even bigger. Like, if we lose this game, and as I say, go crashing out, then I'm not ready for the meltdown online. Well, mate, like, this is where, for what it's worth, I think Unai has got it wrong the last two games. I do, and I'm not going to give him any criticism whatsoever because he does not deserve it. The man has gotten so much right that mistakes are inevitable. But I don't think, I think the team selection on Thursday 
if you're going to do that, you have, and then you you go and lose four 0 at the weekend. You have to, and, and he will feel that. And I'm not going to make a big song and dance about this because I, I don't think it warrants it. But we we definitely put priority on Sunday and having players fit and ready for that game on Sunday, and it didn't work in the slightest. And so now in this situation where we've put even more pressure on this week because we've then gone and lost, and it's like, oh God, we basically have this one-legged knockout tie against Ajax. Thank God it's at Villa Park. But yeah, there, there is huge pressure on this. And Unai is the you know European specialist. And, and that's a, a massive part of why we hired him is those four Europa League titles. And so he has pedigree in this competition. And so we're all inclined and we will absolutely continue to have 100% trust in him. But I do think the buck stops with him this past week. I really do. And whilst I'm, I'm not going to condone the players on on Sunday I do think sometimes there was a little bit of a lack of application John McGinn lost his head you know he can't account for those things but I don't think the setup was right I don't think the teams were right so we have to get Thursday right no we do mate we absolutely do and time is ticking away in the corner mate we don't have long left so I'm gonna spare you of a prediction mate and I'm gonna pass that on to the lovely Villa Villa faithful in the comments let us know your score predictions yeah in the comment section down below if you listen on apple and spotify make sure you download follow share with a friend it all helps more than you guys could imagine we want to see as many of you have us in your spotify top wrap uh come the end of the year that'd be sick really? um and yeah if you listen if you're watching on youtube make sure you like comment subscribe and up the villa